Uh, well, good evening, everybody. Um, thank you for coming and welcome again to another of our Greenway Chambers CPD uh, lecture series. And this is a topic which we visited once and we'll probably visit again in the future, of course, the Security of Payment Act. Um, as we all know, there were a suite of amendments that were the subject of an act passed in November 2018. And uh, following assent, uh, those amendments come into force on the 21st of October 2019, so in around about uh, four weeks' time or so. So uh, Adele and I have uh, put together some thoughts to kind of, uh, encompass those amendments as they've come through. Uh, we split the presentation into two parts. Adele is going to deal with the uh, nuts and bolts, the black and white, if I can put it that way, of the amendments as they have been made. Uh, and it will come into force on the 21st of October. And I'm going to take a perhaps broader look at those amendments and what as lawyers we need to look for when we're dealing with claims and defending claims under the terms uh, of the Act following these amendments. So what is still useful from the jurisprudence around cases such as Southern Han, what's, what will no longer be so useful, what we now need to look for on payment claims and the sorts of issues that are likely to be uh, keenly contested uh, where claims are sought to be enforced or rights are sought to be enforced under the terms of the Act. So without any further uh, comments from me, uh, Adele's going to deal with, as I say, the black and white of the amendments and uh, if you could join me in welcoming her. Thank you, Frank. Um, I hope everyone's got a drink and also the handout that was just over um, on the shelf over there. I will be taking through, as Frank said, the nuts and bolts. For those of you who attended in March of this year, we did do a comparison um, between the current Act, which obviously is going to stay in force, uh, and the amendments. But what I'll just be focusing on tonight is just the amendments. The first one as we all know, is the removal of the reference date concept. Now, reference dates is a term that only really is peculiar to the construction industry. Probably not many other people know outside the construction industry what a reference date is, but it's now being dropped. And Section 8 is now the applicable part where the statutory entitlement to receive a progress payment arises simply by virtue of the construction work being carried out or the supply of the related goods. And the new section, that's at page one, if any of you do have the handout. Section 13, which as we know relates to payment claims, now includes three new sections, and this is on page two of the handout. The effect of which of this um, new regime is where the statute now defines when payment claims can be made and indeed this is now on and from the last day of the named month in which the construction work was first carried out under the contract and from which the last day of each subsequent named month. Now of course under section 13 1b as you can see this default position can be deviated if the relevant provisions provided in the contract an earlier date. You'll also see in section 13.1c um, that there is a new section. Now this overcomes the loophole that was considered by the High Court in Southern Han. And it provides that if the construction contract has been terminated, a payment claim may be served on and from the date of termination. Going back to um, what I referred to in March, this is an oldie but a goodie. Uh, Section 13.2c now introduces what we had back in April of 2014, where a document, if it is to be a payment claim under the Act, needs to state that it is a payment claim for the purpose of the Act. Interesting, this has actually had some mixed reviews. Um, when there was feedback from stakeholders um, to fair trading when the draft was proposed. Um, but it's an important now um, addition, as I said before, we did have this a number of years ago. Simply, if a document is not endorsed with this statement, it will not be a payment claim for the purpose of the Act. Section 
Section 32B, this is on page 6 of those of you who have the handout. Now this is a new section and it prohibits a corporation in liquidation from serving a payment claim or taking action to enforce a payment claim including an adjudication application. So therefore if a company <coughs> had made an application for adjudication before going into liquidation, the application is taken to have been subsequently withdrawn on the day of liquidation. Now, uh, indeed, this overcomes the effect of what some of you may be aware in Seymour White and Osbol in New South Wales Court of Appeal this year on 12th of April. The Court of Appeal found in that case uh, that the Act does apply to companies in liquidation because it's the work that has been carried out not the prospect of work going to be carried out. Uh, also, just for clarification, corporations in receivership or administration remain entitled to payment claims. So this section doesn't apply to those companies. Section 111BA, uh, that's found on page two of the handout, which you may have. This sets the maximum time for payment from head contractor to subcontractor uh, to be reduced from 30 to 20 days. Now indeed, if the head contractor is late in these payments, then the subcontractors have the ability to suspend works and accrue interest on late payments. Now this might have some difficulties where head contractors have government clients and it may affect tendering. Difficulty with this section, uh, and indeed, as we know, SOPA is pay now, argue later, it's all about cash flow, it can have problems at one end where cash flow might be depleted and at the other end of head contracted, nothing's being injected. So in that sense, con contracts, both upstream and downstream, need to take into account this change in this, um, in this section. Section 31, which is something that Frank will be touching on later this evening, is the service of notices. Uh, this is found on page 6 of your handout. This has been amended to admit the words notice and to replace it with documents. Now the definition of document will now include written notice or determination. I think one of the most interesting changes that are, have been or going to be introduced soon is the changes to the adjudication process and indeed there are three sections um, that have been changed. The first one is section 17A. This is on page three of your handout. Claimant now has the ability to withdraw an application at any point before termination. However, subsection 2 of that section says that the respondent does not have to accede to that withdrawal. If there is an objection made by the respondent, then the adjudicator needs to determine that objection by considering what is in the interest of justice. As something that we are familiar with in courts, I look forward to seeing how adjudication, adjudicators are going to deal with this question. The next section that is, um, affects adjudication processes is section 213A. Now this is on page four of the handout. An adjudicator has 10 business days to make a determination after receiving the adjudication response, rather than 10 business days after the adjudicator notifies the parties as to the acceptance of the um, application. I think though the most interesting amendment uh, that will be introduced is section 32A, which is on page six of the handout. This relates to the severance of parts of adjudication determinations that are not infected with jurisdictional error. Pausing at what jurisdictional error is, I do note that the High Court has described it as a verbal coat of too many colours. It's not terribly helpful, but certainly what jurisdictional error is, it's a label, it's not a test. So what is jurisdictional error is certainly far from a settled term, 
but not to worry, I won't be addressing it tonight. That's for another time. What Section 32A does, though, is alter the position which we have known in, in New South Wales, in particular since 2003, uh, in the Supreme Court case of Multiplex and Lucans. Now, if I can read what Justice Palmer observed with respect to jurisdictional error and adjudication determinations. If the adjudicator's decision as to any component part of the adjudicated amount is shown to be liable to be set aside on judicial review, the consequence is that, subject to other discretionary considerations, the whole of the determination must be quashed if jurisdictional error infects any part of the process whereby the adjudication amount has been produced. Now, last year the uh, Court of Appeal in Western Australia considered the common law principles of um, severance. This was considered in a case of Juro and Samsung. Uh, there was also at the time the appeal was heard um, with a concurrent one, Samsung and then Juro. The one we're only focusing on tonight though is Juro. Um, the adjudications determination that was the subject of that particular appeal uh, related to an amount of 49.6 million. It comprised three amounts. The relevant amount was 34 million and it related to a set off claim. The primary judge found that the adjudication's determination was infected by jurisdictional error, so the adjudicator exceeded his jurisdiction when he included in the 49.6 million the amount for the set off. Jury then appealed this, and it was a split bench. Chief Justice Martin uh, was in the minority, um, and the President uh, and Justice Murphy were in the majority. Chief Justice Martin followed what and referred to multiplex and also other um, judgments in Queensland, where he found that an adjudication amount is a single composite determination which cannot and should not be regarded as severable and divisible components. In the majority, they found with respect and regards to the, con uh, the Act being the Construction Contracts Act, the purpose of that Act was not for the adjudication determination to operate as an organic and invisible whole in circumstances where the determination of a payment dispute will typically involve the determination of identifiable, divisible amounts claimed. The majority observed that the final amount is to be paid is no more than the mathematical result of the determination of divisible amounts. It was on this basis, notwithstanding the purpose of the Act, that the majority then applied common law severance principles and found that those parts of the adjudication determination that was not infected with jurisdictional error could be severed. Indeed, what you have in front of you with Section 32A is quite clear language. I think it will be interesting to see how our judiciary will apply this clear language and whether there might be any reference to the jury decision um, handed down last year. The penultimate sections that I'd like to take you to is part 3A. Now this also begins on page 7. This is a significant change. This relates to investigation and enforcement and it's a framework to be administered um, by fair trading. Indeed, this was not something that was raised in the Murray report. Authorised officers are given new powers to investigate, monitor and enforce compliance with the Act, including powers of entry and to make examinations and inquiries. So who is an authorised officer? It's defined as a person employed in the Department of Finance, Services and innovation who was appointed under that part of the Act or under the Fair Trading Act. Now there is no doubt that these provisions are broad and authorised officers can require people to provide information on records and answer questions and they can also enter premises and inspect and seize records. 
The last section and part of the schedule which relates to the amendment regulations is section 34D, which is found at page 13 of the handout. As I'm sure you're now all aware that there is personal liability for directors and management only for executive liability offences by their company, regardless of whether that particular director or manager carried out or was an accessory to the offence. Executive liability offences include section 13.7, which relates to supporting statements, and also um, uh, there are a number of offences which are um, set out in the regulations, which is at the penultimate page of your handout, and they refer back to retention money, um, trust accounts including withdrawal and keeping of records. A person will commit an executive liability offence if they know what the offence is being committed and they're recklessly indifferent as to whether it would be being committed and the person fails, as you'll see in that section, to take reasonable steps to prevent the offence. What amounts to reasonable steps? This is set out at section 34D7. This is on page 14 of your handout and includes the provision of providing appropriate training, instruction and supervision of employees and arranging regular professional assessments of compliance with the Act. The last section which I'd like to take you to is section 34B. <coughs> this is on page 12 of the handout. This is where penalty notices can be issued by authorised officers and I took you to the definition before. This is similar to criminal jurisdiction where the premise behind these penalty notices is deterrence and the penalties for individuals and corporations can be found in Schedule 3 uh, in the penultimate page of the handout that's part of the regulations. I understand from looking also at the Fair Trading website that there is still some consultation with respect to the Code of Practice. Um, that was something that we touched on in March of this year. And also there is apparently some involvement now with stakeholders in introducing uh, potentially new amending regulations. It's anticipated that these regulations uh, may come out before Christmas. Um, if they come out later, I think certainly they'll become part of our super series in, in March. So I'll now hand over to Frank as to the implications of these new sections. Uh, thank you very much Adele. Uh, I'm going to focus on some particular areas and as I s indicated in the outset, looking at uh, from the perspective of lawyers what we need to be um, addressing when a client is concerned with uh, whether or not they have a right under a payment claim or how they might answer it. Uh, as we've already addressed, the single most significant change it appears from the Amendment Act is the removal of the concept of a, of a reference date from Section 8 and Section 13, Subsection 5. Now, since the High Court decision in Southern Hand and Lewins that I'm sure we're all familiar with, the statutory rights and entitlements of a party was undertaken to do construction work to receive a progress payment is fundamentally founded on the existence and identification of a reference date. And this has generally led to two scenarios. Firstly, uh, whether a payment claim was served prematurely or before a reference date had arisen. And secondly, whether there was no available reference date because of the termination of the contract. Now, as we've seen by the amendments to uh, Section 8 and Section 13, firstly, Section 8 provides that the right to a progress payment is simply uh, uh, subject to a person under a construction contract having undertaken to carry out construction work or to supply related goods and services. Secondly, uh, Section 13 then governs the process by which a payment claim may be made. Uh, subsection 1A stipulates that it, a claim may be served on and from the last day of the named month in which construction work was carried out. 1B allows for a contract to adjust that date to make it earlier and 1C expressly provides for a right to make a payment claim upon termination. 
This gives rise to an interesting question that did arise in the case of Southern Hand because that case was not only concerned with the termination of the contract. Uh, in the hypotheses that the uh, courts considered at each of the three levels that the case was addressed, there were two possible explanations as to what had occurred. The developer had validly exercised its right to take the works out of the hands of the contractor, such that the contract remained on foot, but was subject to uh, a process whereby the works were completed and the superintendent made evaluation as to uh, the, what those works were and determined who was to pay what to whom. There was no termination per se in that scenario. Uh, in the second scenario, there was that the act of the developer in taking the works out of the hands was a repudiation which the uh, contractor had accepted. But interestingly, in Southern Hand, the court dealt with both scenarios and came to the same conclusion. And that is to say that through the mechanism or regime under the contract whereby the developer had taken the works out of the hands, there had been a suspension of the rights to payment as expressly provided for in the contract. And that included a suspension of the right to seek uh, payment for works that it had already performed and effectively stopped any further reference date arising after the works had been taken out of the hands and the suspension had occurred. So on one view, when one looks at paragraph 1c, it deals with one of the hypotheses that Southern Hand was concerned with, that is to say termination of the contract without any express provision that the uh, arisal of reference dates survived termination but not the first scenario, whereby under the contractual mechanisms there was a suspension of rights. So one of the issues that is likely to arise is whether a contractual right to suspend payments can impact the right to a progress payment under the new Section 8 and the process under the new parts of Section 13. Um, now, while, in que while the question is open, and obviously there's been no cases <laughs> that de dealt with this yet, um, it's my view, at least, that such a contractual regime or mechanism would not impact on those statutory rights. So that uh, where there was a suspension of works or taking works out of the hands and the contract said no further payments, uh, whilst that might have been operative under the terms of Section 8, which predicated the right to a progress payment on the existence of a reference date, the broader right to a progress payment that's now expressed in Section 8 and the right to seek such a payment by virtue of Section 13 uh, would be seen as overcoming such provisions and indeed any contractual mechanism of that kind or regime of that kind uh, would arguably, and in my view properly arguably, be void under Section 34, which precludes the contracting out of the Act um, by any provisions um, and any such provisions that purport to do so or even discourage use of the Act uh, is void. So, as I say, uh, Section 34 precludes the contracting out of the Security of Payment Act and provides that the provisions of the Act have effect despite any provisions of the, uh, to the contrary in any contract and that any provision of agreement under which the operation of the Act is or is purported to be excluded, modified or restricted uh, or has that effect or may be reasonably considered an attempt to deter a person from taking action is void. So having regard to the revised provision of Section 8, the broader right, founded only upon the fact of performance of works and the process by which a claim may be made, the sort of mechanism that the High Court considered in Southern Hand on the hypothesis that the developer had acted lawfully and within its contractual rights um, would, in my view, not be able to be placed against a statutory right uh, for a progress payment having regard to um, those terms and the provisions of Section 34. The next provision that we then consider is the process under Section 13. Uh, to a certain extent, the issue of a reference date has been moved from an uh, element of the right to a progress payment to a part of the process of making a progress claim. And as we've seen, under Sections uh, 1A or 1B, the uh, right to make a progress payment is on and from a particular date, either the last date of the named month in which construction work has been performed, or an earlier date where the contract so prescribes. So the question then arises is, well, 
is a payment claim invalid if it is served prematurely? That is to say, earlier than the last day of the named month in which the construction work was first carried out, and the last date or day of each subsequent named month, or indeed earlier than when the contract actually provides. Now, in this regard, I think we can take some guidance from two Court of Appeal decisions, one which I expect most are familiar with and another I expect some but perhaps not all are familiar with. The first is um, Chase Oyster and the observation of Justice McDougal sitting in the Court of Appeal at paragraph 209 where he said as follows. The Security of Payment Act gives very valuable and commercially important advantages to builders and subcontractors. At each stage of the regime for enforcement of the statutory right to progress payments, the Security of Payment Act lays down clear specifications of time and other requirements to be observed. It is not difficult to understand that the availability of those rights should depend on strict observance of the statutory requirements that are involved in their creation. The second decision that I considered when looking at these new provisions and how Section 13 might operate is a Court of Appeal decision called All Seasons Air Proprietary Limited and Regal Consulting Services. Now this was a case in which a claim had been served before the specified reference date under the contract, but in the context of the contract it was said that where a claim is made early it shall be deemed to have been made on the date for the making of the claim. And the question that the Court of Appeal was considering is, well, did that deeming provision mean, not only for the purposes of the contract, but for the Act, that the claim that was served early was valid, that is to say had a supporting reference date, or whether it did not? And the Court of Appeal found that it did not. And that that deeming provision, which created a counterfactual situation in their description, whereby legal rights under the contract accrued notwithstanding the early service of a payment claim, whilst effective as a matter of contract, uh, could not be effective as a matter of the Act. And what was said at paragraph 34 at least in considering those matters and indeed the Act generally by Justices Leeming and Payne in a joint decision with whom Justice White had relevantly agreed was that the service of a payment claim under section 13 subsection 1 is an essential precondition to the taking of subsequent steps in the procedure set out in part three of the Act. And quoting Southern Han at paragraph 44, the High Court said, there is no dispute between the parties that service of a payment claim under section 13.1 of the Act is an essential precondition to taking subsequent steps in the procedure set out in part three of the Act. There is accordingly no dispute that unless a payment claim answering that description is served, there can be no adjudication application and hence no adjudication within the jurisdiction conferred by section 22 of the Act. That shared understanding of the relationship between section 13 subsection 1 and section 22 is undoubtedly correct. Now having regard to those decisions, it's my view, uh, again personal, but it is reasonably arguable, but properly reasonably arguable, that if a payment claim is served before the date specified under the new regime of section 13.1a or 13.1b, it will not be a valid payment claim for the purposes of the Act. So reference dates haven't left us entirely, thankfully perhaps, not thankfully for others, but it would seem to me that having regard to those observations by the Court of Appeal as to the operation of section 13 as then was, there is no reason as a matter of principle that those uh, views should not be applied to the regime as it is to be in force for construction contracts entered into after the 21st of October. And so therefore when one is looking at the payment claim, as is the case now, one of the first questions will be, well when was it served? And what work was done that would found the uh, payment claim? Uh, are you within the provisions of section 1A? And if not, uh, then I would think, on my view at least, having regard to those authorities, that the claim will not be valid and you would have a decent chance of knocking, out if, knocking it out if you were faced with one. Of course, the other provisions of Section 13 still apply. There has been some amendment 
to section 13 subsection 5 to remove the, the reference to reference date and it simply states that a claimant may only serve one payment claim in any particular named month for construction work carried out or undertaken to be carried out in that month. And section 13.6 has also been revised and provides that section 13.5 does not prevent a claim or a claimant from serving a single payment claim in respect of more than one progress payment, from including in a payment claim an amount that had been the subject of a previous claim, or serving a payment claim in a particular named month for construction work that was carried out in a previous named month. So looking at those provisions, section 8 and section 13 together, whilst no doubt the removal of reference date has resolved some of the contests of fact and issues that have, ari have arisen in, uh, under the current regime, um, having regard to the terms of section 13 and the observations of the Court of Appeal in those cases and others, uh, as to the importance of strict observance with the requirements of the Act to um, avail oneself of the rights that are available under the Act, that um, it is still important to determine whether the uh, claim was served uh, as required by Section 13. The next requirement that I think as lawyers we all need to be looking out for is does the document that says it's a payment claim contain the statutory endorsement that has now been reintroduced that this is a payment claim under the Building and Construction Industry Security of Payment Act. Now going back to very old authority in this area, it doesn't have to use that precise formulation of words. It might say this is a claim under the Security of Payment Act, it might use a shorthand reference. The courts have said as long as it's quite clear what is being conveyed, taking a common sense approach, that's fine. So there won't be an overly formalistic approach to that. But it's one of the things that should be easily and quickly checked uh, that does the document on its face bear that statutory endorsement. Now to turn to the making of an adjudication application, uh, one of the amendments that we've looked at is the introduction of this right of withdrawal. And for my part at least, possibly because I have a rather narrow set of interests, it really has been vexing me as to how this, ex this right of withdrawal is going to work. Uh, it exists, obviously. The claimant says, I wish to withdraw. The respondent then may communicate an objection, assuming that a, an adjudicator has been appointed. If there's been no adjudicator appointed, there's no objection. If an adjudicator has been appointed, an objection may be lodged. What the Act doesn't say is what the content of that objection is to be. Does a respondent merely get to say, I object, two words? Does the respondent get to set out a series of grounds? Does it get to make submissions? Can the objection be a dozen pages? explaining why, going into chapter and verse, this would present some outrageous miscarriage of justice if the um, uh, withdrawal was allowed to occur. The Act is silent. So presumably, not only is a respondent able to object, but it's not limited in its um, means or method by which it conveys that objection and can offer reasons, may even wish to offer witness statements as to the impact of the withdrawal. Um, financial on the company, legal cost that's been incurred to date, dealing with this claim, will it have to revisit it later? What does it, it, it can't recover costs if the, uh, the adjudication application is withdrawn. A respondent may have spent tens of thousands of, legal, uh, of dollars on legal expenditure getting to the point where it put the response in, only to see an, an applicant say, well, they look like some tricky arguments. I'm not sure I can, we've quite covered those. We better pull this and do it again next time, obviously armed and informed with the position that the respondent has taken in detail. That then, however, leads to the question of, well, assuming the respondent did put in an objection of that kind with detailed submissions and even statutory declarations, does the claimant get to respond? Because the Act doesn't have any provision for it. Is the adjudicator supposed to require submissions? And what happens if the adjudicator doesn't. Does that mean there's been a miscarriage of justice because the claimant has been denied to be heard on this particular point? Um, it's unknown. We, I'm not sure of what the, the answers are there. Whether the adjudicator simply has to deal with it on the basis of some but not all papers, whether the respondent gets a right of reply if the claimant gets to put these submissions in. And of course, time is always ticking for these adjudications. One only has 10 business days without a, a consent extension. So I think this right of withdrawal 
um, may present perhaps a fertile field for legal debate, um, which is always good. And um, because of the lack of clarity as to what the process is, how the objection can be conveyed, what the adjudicator has to consider, and how there might be a miscarriage of justice, a denial of natural justice, in the process of determining that matter of the objection and whether or not the uh, withdrawal is to be permitted. And that could be an action brought by either party, really, whether the uh, withdrawal is permitted or whether the withdrawal is not allowed. So we wait to see. It may be the subject of further amendments. Regulations may come into play. Um, there may be a body of jurisprudence developed in the course of things, but it's certainly something which, as I say, given my uh, narrow interests in life, has been occupying my mind. Um, the other aspect of withdrawal that uh, I was considering is there are express time frames for the making of an adjudication application under section 17.3. Now, it appears to me that these are going to become significant um, given this capacity to withdraw. I mean, let's assume that the adjudication application goes in, the response goes in, the claimant decides for whatever reason it wishes to withdraw the application and notwithstanding the respondent's objection, the adjudicator accedes to it. The question then is, well, what then? We have a payment claim. Can it be the subject of further adjudication application or does the withdrawal of it effectively kill the capacity to seek adjudication of it? Now, in my view, it, it does. Um, in one way, uh, through the absence of any allowance under the terms of Section 17, Capital A, for the resubmission of an adjudication application. And secondly, uh, perhaps more practically, and this may be a fact-driven situation, because under Section 17, Capital A, there is no adjustment to the time frames for the submission of adjudication under Section 17, 3, C, D and E. Under each of those sub-paragraphs of Section 17, 3, there is a specific time frame for the lodgement of, a, of an adjudication application, depending on whether it had a payment schedule, didn't have a payment schedule, um, or there was some in-between position. I can't quite remember each of them, but do your own research on that. Um, but none of those time frames are adjusted where there's a withdrawal. And given that there's no express right to actually resubmit, number one, and practically there may be no capacity to resubmit because time has expired, Withdrawing the payment claim, or withdrawing the adjudication application, I should say, may mean that you are left then, or your, well, the claimant is then left with no capacity to seek adjudication on its payment claim. Now, it appears to me that that is going to be the case because one can contrast what's in section 17 capital A with what's in section 26. There is a right of withdrawal under the Security of Payment Act under section 26, if a claimant fails to receive an adjudicator's notice of acceptance within four business days of the application for adjudication being made, and further, where an adjudicator accepts the application but fails to determine uh, it within the time allowed by section 21 subsection 3, which is 10 days, subject to extension. Now, by section 26.3, where the withdrawal occurs in consequence of those matters, it expressly states that an a new adjudication application may be made at any time within five business days after the claimant becomes entitled to withdraw the previous adjudication application, despite, and these are the express words, despite section 17.3, C, D and E. So the right to withdraw in circumstances of effectively an adjudicator failing to give notice or determine uh, is uh, coupled with the right to make a further adjudication application with respect to that claim and an adjustment to the time frames for the making of an adjudication application pursuant to section 17.3 C, D and E. In contrast, section 17A contains neither allowance. Now, as a matter of statutory construction, one would assume that Parliament was aware of the other provisions in the Act, 
with respect to withdrawal, i.e. section 26, when considering the drafting of this power of withdrawal being section 17 capital A. And one, I would have thought, could reasonably argue, properly argue, that Parliament has deliberately not allowed a claimant who withdraws under the express power of section 17A the opportunity to go again, either expressly, because it hasn't said you may make a further uh, adjudication application with respect to this payment claim, nor has it adjusted the time frames that would usually have expired preventing such an adjudication application to be made anyway. So, of course, none of this would prevent a further payment claim and an adjudication application on the basis of that claim armed with the information that one had gathered through the previous process and the withdrawal, but there's not much we can do about that, unfortunately. In the context then of withdrawal, it is important where a claimant thinks that it might be in its interests to withdraw because of what it's seen in a respondent's uh, adjudication response. I think we need to be very careful to inform the client that, well, you can do this, but unless you're going to have the opportunity to, have, to go again, then you may then be abandoning any right that you would have for adjudication in respect of your claims. And if you pull it, you've burnt the bridge, the ship has sailed, whatever, whatever metaphor or, or simile you want to use, um, it's, it's all over, at least in respect of that payment claim. So it's, I think that's an important thing. We need to make sure that the clients understand that this right, which appears on its face to be somewhat beneficial, may in fact um, be not so beneficial if it results in, say, the last payment claim in the set um, not being put to adjudication. Uh, all right. The next thing I wanted to talk about is service. Now, there are certain amendments in section 31 with respect to service. Um, they don't appear to be particularly uh, broad, simply changes the word notice to documents largely, and there's a, there's a revised form of section 31E that's been introduced. But as we all know, service is often a very key issue in proceedings, particularly uh, where a claim is made for a statutory debt on the basis that no payment schedule has been served, the section 14.4 entitlement. Now, I have actually prepared a paper, I'm not just standing here doing this off the top of my head, the paper will be on, on our website and I've set out the relevant provisions as to service under section um, 31 uh, as they will appear following the amendments um, in paragraph th or at paragraph 35 of that uh, paper. But what I wanted to focus on in terms of service are two provisions because they concern the service of documents by email. Now we all know email is prevalently used for communication um, in all sorts of business, but particularly in construction contracts. Very few, if any, payment claims are faxed. Um, some are hand-delivered, the important ones perhaps, but most, conveniently and um, commercially, quite rightly, are emailed. Now, where you have a situation where one party says, look, we emailed the payment claim, they haven't given us a payment schedule, we want to uh, take action. There are a number of provisions of the Act, the contract, but also the Evidence Act that you may wish to consider. There are provisions associated with the service of documents electronically, both under the Evidence Act and uh, under other legislation which uh, slips my mind for the moment, which govern what happens and when documents have been served when they're delivered by email and there's deemed receipt to when the uh, record shows that the document was uh, sent. They may be important for uh, determining or at least proving when the payment claim was actually sent to that particular email address. But that may not be enough. Section 311D does allow the service of documents by email, but it is to an email address specified by the person for the service of documents of that kind. 
So you're going to have to establish that the person, it just says the person, I assume that I would sub submit, I should say, that the person in that context is the person with responsibility for dealing with the payment claim, whether that be the project manager on the other side or superintendent or whoever, not just you know, Billy from accounts, but someone who actually has authority and would have some knowledge about the payment claim and be able to deal with the contents of it. That that is the email address specified by that person for the delivery of payment claims. So often we have situations where the claim is emailed to someone else or the claim is emailed to a contract administrator or something like that. We need to be aware that that may not be sufficient service given the strict obligations that arise, the time frames involved, et cetera, et cetera, pursuant to section 31.1d. It may be necessary, it would be necessary, I should say, to establish as a matter of evidence that service to that email address was specified by that person for that purpose. The other provision of section 31.1, which is important, is, sex, is subsection E, because that allows service by a party to a construction contract on another party to the construction contract in the manner that may be provided under the construction contract. Now that section 311E is a change. It is not what the current form of section 311E says. Now again, it's not uncommon where in a formal, in a written construction contract there may be various forms of service, email will be identified, there will be an email address. Um, specified in the terms or, of the contract or in the particulars of the contract, um, which is then never used. And, and some other email address is used, whether by way of convenience or practice or instruction, and throughout, or maybe for the first payment claim, that's where the document gets sent. We, it would need to be established how that provision of the contract was changed or varied so that the stipulated email address contained in the particulars the contract was not used. Otherwise, the fact that you've sent it to Billy from accounts will not get you, arguably, the right to a statutory debt pursuant to section 14.4 because service is key to determine whether or not a payment schedule has not been issued as required by the Act. So given, the, given that email is commonly used for the delivery of payment claims in all projects at all levels, uh, it is very important to have regard to those two provisions and to identify whether the email address that you that your that the claimant's been sending the claim to is one that's stipulated by the contract. If so, happy days, tick that box, move on. Or if it's not, why isn't it? And how can one show or prove against that service to that email address was to be service for the purposes of the Act? You know, there might be a verbal involved. You know, they said to me, don't worry about it, just send it here. Uh, but if there's going to be a verbal, it would nice, be nice always to have a course of conduct to back it up. So if you can show that you, this is the 11th payment claim and all previous 10 have been sent to the same place, they've all been dealt with by the uh, respondent you know, within time or in a fashion uh, so that it was actually being received, um, then that will obviously assist. And you can plead estoppels and say you can't raise that point now because we've undertaken this course of conduct and a convention's been adopted. But it's important to look at the context and concept of service, um, both for these amendments and generally. Now, an alternate path with respect to service uh, is to show that the document actually got to the person who was supposed to receive it. And I'm just going to refer to the decision of Falgat Constructions and Equity Australia Corporation. You're probably familiar with it, but it's always worth returning to the uh, classics. Um, in that decision, uh, Justice Hodgson, with whom Justices Handley and Hunt relevantly agreed, said that, in my opinion, it is clear that if a document has actually been received and come to the attention of a person to be served or provided with the document, or of a person with authority to deal with such a document on behalf of a person or corporation to be served, it does not matter whether or not any facultative regime has been complied with. It relies on the decision of Howship Holdings and Leslie and Mohammed and Farah. So the alternative, if you've got an email situation, is to seek to demonstrate that 
uh, it in fact got to the hands or the attention of the person who was uh, charged to deal with it, authorised to deal with it for the purposes of the contract, um, and the time relevantly expired and therefore you have the entitlement that you claim or uh, is claimed under section 14.4. The other matters that have been touched on, uh, I don't propose to go into the um, setting aside in part where only part of an adjudication determination is affected by jurisdictional error or the company in liquidation or the maximum time, they're all fairly straightforward um, and I would have thought easily recognisable and dealt with if, if necessary to do so. Uh, so those are the matters that I wanted to do, uh, review in the context of amendments, but also just generally when dealing with the Security of Payment Act. The only thing I'd close on is by saying that we're all probably familiar with the recent Court of Appeal decisions which have narrowed the field in terms of what is or is not jurisdictional error. Um, this whole concept of good faith that was floating around for some time has been um, killed. And uh, we're really, in the terms of jurisdictional error, looking at natural justice and whether or not uh, there was any jurisdiction at all. That is to say whether or not the adjudication was properly established under the terms of section 17. And that then goes back to the point I was making about the timeframes under section 17.3. They're the remarks I wish to make. Um, I'd like to open it up now for easy questions. Any hard questions you can put in writing and direct to uh, Ian Roberts, <laughs> where he is. So, um, but uh, yes, uh, if, if anyone has any questions, we're willing to try to engage with them. Yes. Um, and I think I know the answer, but and I find it quite surprising that it's, this is the effect, but um, the effect of the removal of the reference date yep. on milestone payments. Milestone payments are a very useful way of dividing up uh, yes. payment arrangements, roof on, lock up, whatever. But for, as the way I see it, if it's, it's, a, it's a month or less, you can't have milestone-based payments anymore. And not under the Act. Certainly under the contract you can, but the, the, you're quite right. Uh, there was, uh, milestones were referred to in the definition of reference date that's now been removed, and it was certainly allowed. Um, I must say for my own part, I didn't see many successful cases defended on the basis that there was no reference date because a milestone hadn't been reached, because the judges all tended to say, well, it's a matter of fact for the adjudicators, so they have to figure it out for themselves. Um, and if they found that the work was done sufficiently, then you had a reference date, and if you, they found that you didn't, then you didn't. So um, it was a rather unsatisfactory area, but it's a good observation that um, this Act does not contemplate the use of milestone dates for progress payments under any form of contract. It's under the contract, and it can be subverted by claims every month under the Act. So and, and it may indeed be void under Section 34. Yeah. Because the concept of a milestone may involve the performance of works for a period longer than a month. And if you're, uh, if that's the provision, then arguably you fall foul of section 34. Any other questions? So you're, oh, and you're not all completely informed. Yes. Oh, <laughs> the um, the severed part of the judgment, uh, presumably that is entitled to be re-agitated re by a claimant I haven't studied the jurisprudence from the West as much as my colleague Adele has, so I, I'm not quite sure about that answer and I'm happy for her to comment. My own initial reaction would be, well, if the adjudication has been made but it is void because of jurisdictional error, then there is in fact no adjudication for the purposes of section 22 and therefore yes, it could be the subject of further uh, claim through the course of claim response and adjudication. Is that, I'm getting nods so that's good. Is there anything else? Well, uh, as you're now all fully informed, um, uh, Pat, uh, I'd like to thank you all for coming. I'd like to invite you to join us for some refreshments and uh, look forward to seeing you on the next occasion. Thank you very much.